Welcome to the Secret Sauce of Selling podcast, the ultimate guide and sales gym to unlocking the secrets of successful selling. I'm your host, James Abraham, and I'm super excited to be here with you today with Matt Nendleton to share insights, tactics, and strategies to help you take your sales performance and sales leadership game to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. This week, we have Matt Nettleton, a huge, huge, huge mentor for me, um, a rock star in the sales performance training and development space. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks, James. Happy to be here. This is kind of fun. Excellent. And uh, our topic today is practice versus rehearsal. What are we talking about? So, I, you know, Sandler, we're all about reinforcement and we do ongoing training and we're not one time events. Um, and that's practice. You know, I, I played high school football and we, we would have practices and we would go out to practice. But before the season started, we always had a rehearsal. And the rehearsal was when we put together all the things that we had practiced into the actual event. Right. So we, we'd wear our game uniform. We'd, we'd come into the locker room at the time we were going to come in before a game. We'd have the meetings that we were going to have. We'd have this talks that we were going to have. We'd walk out onto the field. We'd do the warm up, the whole thing. Right. We, we rehearsed so that we all knew what to expect when the event happened. And, and I think one of the things that's overlooked in sales training and in sales performance and in sales leadership is we're all pretty good at practicing skills, right? We, what's your upfront contract sound like? What questions will you ask? What, what reverses will you do? But we, we actually let rehearsal become a by default mental game. And we never put all those skills together in a way that we expect the event to go well and for us to succeed. Hmm. Right? Most of our rehearsal is by default, as we drive in our car or ride on a subway train or fly in a, and we come up with the 29 million different ways this is going to go wrong. <laughs> but we never actually think about, you know, hey, here are the things that are going to happen that are going to be great. Here's, here's how this is going to come together and work. Here's what victory or success sounds like. Yeah, it's just like the Rubik's Cube, isn't it? Yes. You, you rehearse it a couple of times. You can do it in like 23 seconds. I saw a guy juggling, young guy, the other day. I actually took a video of this. Young, he was juggling three. He was juggling two. He was solving one. And he basically solved all three of them in less than, what was it, like 100 seconds or something? I think we measured it. It was like a minute and 10 seconds or something ridiculous. Yeah. And now how did he get there? How did he do that? Well, so let's unpack it. Let's unpack yeah. it. I mean, you know, let's talk about, let's go for the, you know, let's go to the nasty side of things for a second. What does bad pre preparation look like or sound like? Well, so, so if yes. any of the listeners here, guys, listen to what, if this is happening, then you're in big, big trouble. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so bad preparation sounds like um, where you kind of sit down and you read your deck. You, you know, you, you, you say, Hey, I'm going to learn how to do a demo, right? And so you 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 walk people through a tour of your software, and you know then you go, well, I got it nailed. I I'm fine. Perfect. I mean, I, if they watch this demo, there's no way they can't buy. Exactly. Now the fact that the demo doesn't relate to what the buyer actually does, and it just shows off the technical details that your engineers like, and and has no impact. I mean, it's, it doesn't really impact the buyer. That's like terrible preparation for a sales call. Yep. The middle preparation is you actually learn systematically how to run a process. And you learn it in chunks, the way people learn things. You know, so when I showed up to play college football, Coach Vignon, uh, the first practice that we had, I played linebacker, and he, he screamed, Nettleton, what are you doing with your hands? And, and, you know, it was like that. I don't know I'm, what I always do with my hands. And he, and he said, well, listen, as a linebacker, there are 53 different ways you can hold your hands before a play starts. And here's the one that works for us. Right. And if you think about selling, there are probably 53 different ways to start a sales call. And for us, it's an upfront contract. Like you can do any version of an upfront contract you want, but that's the only thing that you can do at the beginning of a call. And right? at the end. 
at the end of the call. At the end of the call and 21 times in the middle of the call, right? But it's it's permission-based selling. That's what we believe in. And, and yeah. so learning how to do those individual skills is great. That's 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 the middle zone of preparation. Okay. And what's the top zone? So the top zone is is where you practice the entire thing and you run through from beginning to end what a sales call looks like and and you start to look for what does winning sound like and what what questions do you ask that when you hear a certain response you know yeah this is probably a good fit for us and and what things do you know you know if i was also in my senior class play in high school right and so what things do you know the other person has to do in the scene that you're in and then Really, the, the key to that is you start to, to manage your mental game so that you don't think that the problems that you have, and by the way, we all have problems, but the, you start to believe that the problems you have are neither permanent nor pervasive. I mean, yeah. yeah, sure, every once in a while something goes wrong, but I know how to fix it, and I expect to be able to fix it. So I want to take this for, to a neuro selling or neuroscience side for a second, just so that the listeners and viewers can get an idea of the science behind this. And just let me see if, if we're aligned. Um, so when we're, when we got a sales guy, and I'm talking to leaders right now, you got a salesperson and you're coaching that person towards an, a, a meeting that he needs to attend. And you might say to that person, well, do you know what you need to do? He says, yes, well, I need to do this, that, and the other. He says, yeah, well, here's exactly what you say. And then you go and tell him. That salesperson will only remember 20% of what comes out of that sales leader's mouth. Well, not only will he only remember 20% of what comes out of that salesperson's mouth, but the words don't really matter. Exactly. At all. Like the, exactly. the situational coaching, which is really situational training, which is the lowest level of instruction that you can deliver, is, is it makes the person delivering it feel good. It just doesn't produce a result that benefits yeah. Yep, absolutely. And so that that rule of people only remember, people will remember 80% of what they say, but only 20% of what someone else says. And that's true for our selling as well. That's why we like the 20-80 ratio. Um, but when you translate that to prep, basically, if, if, the, if the sales leader is not actually getting his salesperson to verbalize and articulate the actual words, so the, the, that person can hear what they need the chances of them then performing are close to close to zero. Is that a fair statement? Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, every leader has four roles. Obviously, they've got to recruit, they've got to train, they've got to supervise, and they've got to coach. And when we get to coaching, one of the things we talk to our leaders about is the I go, you go model of role playing. Right? So if I'm, if I'm going to coach a salesperson, you know, and, and I say, well, tell me how the meeting's going to start. And they go, well, you know, I'll probably do an upfront contract. What I would say is, hey, James, I appreciate you're going to do an upfront contract. Why don't we do this? I'll do my version of an upfront contract first, and then you do what you're going to say second. And so I show them, hey, here's how I would say it. Now you tell me how you would say it. And so we both get to hear it. Lead by example. Lead by Lead example. By yeah, I love it. I love it. And, and and so translating that to some of the, the more, I'd say, challenging things that the salespeople need to do on sales calls. I mean, what are the biggest challenges you find these days salespeople shy away from, from a technique perspective or a behavioral perspective that is probably impact, uh, driven by a mindset thing? But what are your thoughts? I mean, what, what's, what are the biggest challenges? What do they just shy away from and hide under a rock? So uh, obviously, um, everybody is scared about the economy. Right. Because, you know, you read the newspaper or, well, whatever the newspaper is now, you read, you go online. Nobody reads newspapers, but you go online, you read the news and it's all shaky. And, and every time the economy goes sideways, salespeople get scared about actually cleaning their pipelines. Like they, there's no pipeline sanitation. So they get clogged pipelines and they're clogged with exactly what you expect them to be clogged with deals that aren't going anywhere because the prospect has said, hey, I'm not really going to do this. And the, and the salesperson said, so you're telling me there's a chance. I'll just keep you on my list. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. And so let's translate to the actual calls when they're in there because they're not practicing. Where do they usually fall? Where are the pitholes they would, they, they, 
they would they would fall into if they're not practicing and not rehearsing and not just getting becoming the best version of themselves. Yeah. So what what they'll fall into is they'll run the sales call that they want to run, which will be a clumsy presentation. It will be them telling the buyer all the good things about the salesperson. Let me tell you about the product. We've won awards. We've gotten funding. We have great features. You're going to love our API access, best API access on the West side. I mean, it's it's all the stuff that doesn't matter to the buyer. And, and they're not going to react appropriately to questions the buyer asks, problem the buyer has, or plans the buyer has. They're, they're, they're not going to actually respond appropriately. Is that because they don't know what to do or because they just... Well, because what they practiced was delivering, not receiving. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember who said that. Who said um, amateurs practice uh, Amateurs practice to try and get it right. Professionals, yep. pra- uh, professionals work out to never get it wrong. Yes. Yeah, that's how so they screw it up. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. So I want to take a step back for a second and, and um, love to hear how you got into how you got into sales? So I, uh, I I ruptured all the ligaments and tendons, both my thumbs one summer, or playing football, had had my right thumb fixed and uh, and had to get a job. I had always loaded trucks, like I'm, you know, big dumb ox, move heavy stuff. That's that was my that was my youth, um, and and so I couldn't lift anything over twenty five pounds, so I. I had to get a job because my parents weren't going to give me money. And uh, there was a one ad in the paper. It said limited effort, great money. So I called the guy up and I said, I'm in. What, what do I have to do? And he said, well, we do open interviews Thursday morning. Uh, come on in. So I walked into a room. There were 42 people. Guy walks up to the front on a little raised platform, holds up a coffee cup. He says, my name's Jim McVeigh. I own the business. Uh, we sell vacuum cleaners door to door. I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. If anybody's still here, I'll happy to talk to you when I come back. And so 40 people left. Um, and when he came back, it was myself and a guy named Paul Muma standing in the middle of a room. Um, and I said, why the hell did you stay? And he said, well, my parents said I had to get a job. They didn't say I had to make money. He goes, why are you here? And I said, well, I can't lift anything heavy and I don't know what else I would do. And that summer I sold um, 36 vacuum cleaners as the best salesman in, in three states, you know, Pennsylvania, New York, and, and uh, Ohio, and won a scholarship. Uh, from the Liberty Division of the Kirby Vacuum Cleaner Company. That's awesome. Now, I remember vividly, and, and, and for those of you that do not know Matt, Matt is a very gifted man. Matt knows how to play play with your head and make you, make you negatively agree to stuff that you would not think is rational. From And actually get you to make it their, like get the buyer to make it their idea in a very elegant way. So I remember a very vague, a story you told me a while back regarding that vacuum cleaner um, and how you learn how to sell that stuff. Could you, could you share that with the listeners? I, I can. So, uh, so the Kirby vacuum cleaners has a little attachment. When you go into somebody's home, you actually have the vacuum cleaner. And the deal is you basically knock on their door and say, Hey, uh, trying to make a little bit of money. Would you be willing to let me uh, shampoo your carpets? If you would sit through a, a 45 minute presentation and you know, people would usually say, no, please leave because it's prospecting and nobody likes that. But every once in a while, you run into somebody that'll say yes. And so I would go into people's homes. And the first time that I went into somebody's home to present this vacuum cleaner is I started to run the vacuum. Uh, I discovered that I was allergic to cat hair and dust and I had an asthma attack. And so um, part of the Kirby vacuum cleaner is you you run the vacuum and you get these little discs covered with dirt. And you start laying them on the floor to show people all the dirt they're leaving in their home. Well, I got five of these discs out and I had a heaving, unable to breathe asthma attack. And I just looked at the, the housewife and I said, ma'am, I have, I have to apologize. This has never happened to me before. Would you be OK if I stepped outside and, uh, and, and just put myself back together? And she said, yeah, that, no problem. So I stepped outside. It took me about five minutes to come back together. I'm sweating, you know, and I'm a mess. Um, I walk back in and uh, husband and wife sitting there and, and they said, hey, we're, we're not interested in the vacuum cleaner. And, and we're really uncomfortable with you having an asthma attack in our house. Um, why don't you just pack up and leave and you don't have to worry about shampooing our carpet? And I said, that's fine. Happy to do it. So I put 
take the vacuum cleaner apart, put it back in the box. Now I got these five discs covered with dirt sitting on the floor and uh, I'm looking at them and I just took the discs and flipped them over and rubbed the dirt back in the carpet. And obviously, you know, everybody comes unglued and they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, listen, I'm making eight bucks an hour here and I got to pay for those discs. The dirt was here when I got here and the dirt's going to be here when I leave. It obviously doesn't bother you, but I need the disc for my next presentation. And they said, well, we, we don't want the dirt. I said, no, you don't want the vacuum. You already had the dirt. The dirt was here before I got here. You, you don't want the vacuum. You're okay with the dirt. And they said, no, we, we don't want the dirt. And, and I said, well, remember, you told me $1,200, crazy amount to pay for a vacuum cleaner. This is 1988. Like $1,200 was real money then. You know, now it's like a cup of coffee and two scrambled eggs. But, <laughs> but they're like, yeah, we don't want it. We, we, don't, we, we don't want the dirt. I said, well, listen, you had the dirt. Well, they ended up buying the vacuum cleaner. Like I argued the whole time that all they did, you know, hey, listen, you had the dirt. You want to keep the dirt? You don't want the vacuum. You already told me you didn't want the vacuum. I'm good with that. I'm packed up. I'm ready to go. Let me get out of here. Well, I, I did that 36 times. And 36 times I ended up having an asthma attack. I did not know that this was a problem I had. Um, but it, it actually turned out to be fairly profitable. It was your process. It was my process. I mean, it just, I, I'm good at, I'm good at recognizing patterns. So after the third time it happened, it was like, well, now I know what I need to do. Yeah. I think you really hit the nail on the head, right? Right. With this, um, it's about recognizing patterns. I think as salespeople and sales leaders, we need to recognize patterns. We need to be, um, aware of what's happening. So then we can actually, we can sharpen up our saw. We can sharpen up our process. And then we know what to practice on. We know what or what rehearse on and what to work on. But you have to be careful. So back in 2002, Seth Godin wrote an article about superstitious pigeons. And, and it was, you know, you can train a pigeon to do a lot of different things for a piece of food. And salespeople are very similar, right? So salespeople go out and they make a sale and they look around. They go, well, what caused that? And they go, well, it must have been the socks. It's my lucky socks. And so the next time they, they do a totally different sales process, but they wear the socks and they assume they're going to get the same result because the socks are the magic, right? So it's, yeah. you got to be careful about what it is you're paying attention to in the pattern. 100%, 100%. I, I, that, that's, that's, that, that goes without saying. And so focusing, I'm going to take us back to the practice and rehearsal piece. Um, what do you believe these days professionals, sales professionals, sales leaders, you believe they struggle with? practicing and rehearsing the most? I mean, are there specific techniques that they struggle with? Um, is there head trash that they deal with? Because when it comes to this stuff, you know, I, I know a lot of people that just they'll, they'd rather die than, than do a role play. So what well, are your thoughts? Tell me. Yeah. I mean, practice is terrible. I mean, practice is boring. It's monotonous. It's difficult. Done well. It wears you out and frustrates you. Um, but it just happens to be vital. Right. And so the, the biggest problem that I have with salespeople is that they think they're masters before they've done the work. You know, it, Malcolm Gladwell misused the, the 10,000 hour study. But the reality is, whether it's 100 hours or 10,000 hours, everything complex that we've ever learned to do in life involves a stand, stagger, fall progression where you stand up, like you, you imagine you're a, you know, a nine month, 12 month old baby, you stand up, you're trying to learn how to walk, you stagger a couple steps, and then you fall. And you stand up and stagger a couple. Uh, imagine the baby, you know, gets to the point where they can do five steps. And they're like, Yeah, that's it. I'm done practicing. This is as good as it gets. Or even worse, imagine the second time the baby stands, staggers and falls. The parent says, Listen, Crawling's good for you. Don't worry about walking. That'll be fine. No need to practice. Right? Those are the so you have the 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 pressure from the management team of, hey, we don't need to practice anymore. Just go sell. And you have the pressure from the salesperson going, listen, I did five steps. How much more do you need me to do? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like to translate that to and I love the baby piece. Um, I say this, you know, we're born, uh, we're born curious. We're born a little science scientists, right? And we grow up, we're really curious. And we're curious and we're crawling and we stand up and we walk and we're touching and we're curious and curious and curious. And at some point, those babies, uh, us people, 
they, they take a fork in the road. Some of them continue to be very curious. Some of them become very needy. And that neediness, uh, neediness for attention, neediness for recognition, need for approval, fear of rejection, all that stuff, that's what drives amateur salesmanship as opposed to professional salesmanship. And I think today it's, it's just focusing on continuing to be curious, curious so we can be better, curious why things work, why didn't they not work, what could have happened otherwise, and so on. And I think that 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 fork in the road, that whip junction, as we call it at Sana, right? That whip yep. junction is all about maintaining and keeping curiosity ahead of the curve. What are your thoughts? Well, so I, I have a belief that asking questions is a discipline, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's it, it's not it, it's not some it's not a, a skill because if you if you go on a sales call, you're going to probably ask the same questions. For the next five years of your life. So it's a discipline of are you willing to do the basics over and over again? But being able to hear the answers and actually react appropriately is a learned skill. And great people, people are disciplined about questioning and yeah. skilled in listening. And fearless of the, the answer too, because a lot of people don't ask the question because they're afraid of what they'll hear. Yeah, well, what's the worst case? I, I asked somebody hey, does this even make sense to you? And they say no. They were going to say no whether or not I asked. I might as well, you know, ask the question so I have to go find somebody else to sell to. 100%. I'd rather be stupid for two seconds than for the rest of my life. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so, Matt, I'd love to ask you, what is your secret sauce for selling? So, so my secret sauce is constant practice with disciplined rehearsal. Mm. So constant it. practice of the skills and techniques, you know, we, we have a weekly call inside the Sandler network Friday mornings that we have practice and it's all practice, practice, practice. But then there's also the rehearsal where I, I, in my written journal, I write out how I expect things to go. I talk about how I, how I'm going to succeed. I talk about the good things that are going to happen. I, I go through the process of becoming an, an inverse paranoid. Right. Yeah. So a paranoid person believes everybody's out to hurt them. An inverse paranoid believes everybody's out to help them. And it takes time to become an inverse paranoid. So that's that's the really the secret sauce. And it's it's a constant enjoyment of the game and the skill of selling. I love it. I love it. Is there anything uh, cool that you're listening to, watching? It could be a movie, it could be a play, it could be a miniseries, it could be a book, a podcast, whatever you you know, anything you'd like to share with the viewers. And so if I if I could recommend four books, I, I I would recommend four books for every salesperson, and two of them are by Annie Duke. The first one is Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke. Mm -hmm. She's a professional poker player, and it, it talks about how do you make decisions with incomplete information. The mm, second right. one is Quit by Annie Duke. Because the most important thing successful people learn how to do is quit appropriately. The, the, the third and fourth book are both by a guy named Trevor Moad. And, and the first book would be uh, It Takes What It Takes, which ironically I, I read one week before the COVID shutdown. And the second book by Trevor Moad that I would recommend is Getting to Neutral. Getting to Neutral. Excellent. So those, those would be the four books that I would recommend for anybody in professional sales. I love it. Matt, how can uh, the listeners and viewers get in touch with you, connect with you? So you could, you could uh, search for Sandler DTB Indie uh, on any social media platform. Uh, Matt Nettleton on LinkedIn is... Uh, LinkedIn, my my username is Get Matt. Um, so, you know, just on that. So, Matt Nettleton in Indy or Sandler DTB Indy will will lead you to me. Perfect, Matt. Thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. And um, for anyone out there, um, this stuff is go pure gold. And all we need is sometimes just take a, a few bitty bits of gold and start to put them into into implementation. And um, I'm a huge believer in practice and rehearsal with my, myself and reinforcement. Uh, repetition is the mother of all skills. And uh, the more you work out, the stronger you will become. It's all that muscle memory. That's how we do it. Uh, Matt, thank yep. you so much for joining us. I really appreciate uh, uh, your insight and your knowledge. I uh, want to give a huge shout out to uh, Novacy, our sponsors. Novacy unlocks behavioral insights from virtual meetings. 
to help sales professionals and leaders close more business and know exactly what's happening in between what is being said and what isn't being said. So check out Novacy. And, um, and for me, James, i um, looking forward to seeing you guys on our next podcast. Um, I am uh, embarking uh, on, a, on a journey to create, to train, and to help nourish and uh, nurture the most powerful generation of sales professionals the world has ever seen. So you can continue to join me on this podcast. You can subs- hit the subscribe button and you can follow me on LinkedIn um, together with my colleagues, Matt, and so many other successful sales professionals uh, because sailing is a force for good, but we have to recognize that and be on the right side. So may the fourth be with you, the fourth of May here. May the fourth be with you. Sell well, be well, do the right thing for the right reasons and see you next time.